The following extract comes from Don't Stop Believing by Olivia Newton-John, published by Simon and Schuster. I never thought of my role in Greece as only playing one character. Most of us have a sandy number one in us. We have all-American pure looks, but we also have a bit of sandy number two. Number two smoked, wore black leather, and high heels, and wrapped her legs around a boy as he danced her through the grounds of the high school. Sandy number two was deliciously wild. It was a great build-up of excitement inside me to finally bring her to life. Costume designer Albert Wolski found some body-hugging, high-waist, skin-tight black shark-skin pants. Even better than the leather from the 1950s. It was so old, there was just one pair, so there was no room for error. When I tried them on for the first time, the zipper was broken, and Albert didn't want to rip them, trying to put on a new one instead. I would be sewed into them each morning. What if I need to pee? What am I going to do? One of the most memorable moments of my entire career was I, the first time I stepped out of the trailer as a full Sandy number two. I had a sexy curly hair, thick black eyeliner, and mascara galore. My lips were slaughtered in a bare galed red lipstick. My top was squeezed tight. My legs and behind was poured into those pants. Tell me about it. Stud, indeed. There were gasps, that cat calls, and a lot of whistling. John was filming the song Sandy. His eyes strutted across the set. He stopped singing mid note in his, as his head jerked up and his eyes popped. Tell me more, tell me more. He stood up and shouted. We laughed so hard. Exactly the reaction I wanted. John Vivalta remembers. I can't believe it. It was just so right to see her with that Mary Monroe hairdo. It's so perfect. I knew the audience would have an exact same reaction, a heart palpitation. It felt empowering, as pure and genuine. The idea of claiming my own sexiness rushed through the body. My body. All the men on the crew began to double and triple as they turned around to stare at me with jaws that headed south, I think a sandwich or two hit the floor. All the girls on the set immediately wanted the outfit, and all the guys were willing to buy it for them. If only had enough to have thought to make copies of those pants and sell them, I could have made a fortune. Later people would say it was a terrible message to give young girls that we were telling them to, to sex it up to get their man. But it was about choice. Wear those pants or a dress down to the floor. Empowering comes from calling your own shots and being who you want to be. The outfit would pull the shy Olivia Newton-John out of her comfort zone in many other ways. Later, it even gave her gave me the courage to release the song physical. That last scene in Greece instantly changed my life image. In 1971, composer Jim Jacobs and Warren Casey wrote Greece about youth culture, girls and greasers, set in a high school. John DeVolta was the easy first choice for handsome, rugged Danny Zico. I was so busy touring the world that Greece wasn't even on my radar. In 1976, fate intervened. Australian singing legend Helen Hen- Hen- Relly invited me to a burning party at her house in Los Angeles. There I met producer Alan Carr, who said he opted the film rights. It was going to be a worldwide phenomenon. It hasn't he hasn't cast a female lead. And he said, you would make a wonderful Sandy. I was 28 and San- John 23. I couldn't play a high school, stu- school junior, student at 28. I'm too old for Sandy, I told Alan. No, I can't do an American accent. He would change the script to make Sandy an Australian transfer student. Well, they really were trying to make that work for me, but I was still hesitant. I agreed that it would be nice to see the play before I made my final decision. In London, Richard Gere had a lead role on stage as Danny Zito. At the time, he was beyond wonderful in it. 
Something about the grease began to nag at me. It's so much fun. The songs are wonderful. Sandy's a great character. It'll give me the opportunity to play two different girl, type of girls. Could I even pull that off? I decided I would part. I could would pass. Then Danny Zito himself walked up my front steps. In person, Johnny Travolta radiates pure joy and love. He is one of the most genuine and sweet people on earth. He really cares for other human beings on a deep level. That day, John greeted me with a big hug. They were already lifelong friends. with no expectations or promises. We were just two people who were lucky enough to spend a gorgeous sunny afternoon enjoying each other's company. I was asked who, who would be my perfect lady. I was asked who would be my perfect lady, leading lady in Greece. There's only one human being on the planet I would, could, would, could see, as Sandy John said. That person w- was Living Newton John. I told the producers, I promise you, Danny Zico, Sandy, I promise you that Danny Zico Sandy is Olivia and no one else could, should play it. In the end, we agreed that we, an actual screen test would be a good way to make me feel comfortable. How could you say no to John Devout? A week later, I was on his on the Paramount lot in Los Angeles, John came out to greet me. Our eyes met when we walked inside the room together. It was magic. Everyone saw it. They couldn't deny this kind of chemistry. Yes, I finally said, I'll do it. Those four words changed my life. Shooting took place during the summer of 1977. John and I shot the evening Opening beach scene at Malibu's gorgeous Leo Carlo State Beach. A quick minute from my house, John and I followed on the shore and raced each other into the foamy ocean. We were at that moment flirting, kissing and establishing what would later become one of the most beloved couples in movie history. I wasn't very experienced in the acting world, but I had so much support from the cast. John was equally protective of my of me during the big bonfire scene i did the first take only to have him walk right in front of the camera during my close-up sorry i messed up he apologized he took me to one side love love i did that on purpose because i didn't want them to use that take he whispered i know you can do better i had great love and support for him and the feeling was mutual i would be ever grateful for his concern now let's set the record straight. Did I ever date John? Oh, the great set. He would tell me, Lev, it's great. You're every guy's dream to have, to have you as their girlfriend. I don't know about every guy as tease. Yes, we really did like each other. There was no, there was an attraction, but he would never date because we were both involved with other people at the time. And both of us have a loyalty streak that runs deep. The truth is never went beyond friendship. But John, despite the fact that fans wanted badly for us to become a couple in real life, that is what John remembered in about uh, almost happened between us a few times, but it didn't. Sometimes life just offers you the wrong timing. We had to leave it as dear friends. It wasn't tough having to kiss John, professionally speaking, although having to do it in front of the crew was a new thing of, of, of for me. On screen, it was a type of chemistry you can't fake. You either have it or you don't. We had it. Thank goodness. We wrapped Greece in the world in autumn of 1977 and had a long wait till June 16th, 1978, our official release date. There's a general anxiety about how audiences respond to such a clean movie set in the 1950s. The premiere was on June 2nd at Man's Chinese Theatre on Hollywood Boulevard. All of a sudden it seemed quite real and quite big. John and I rolled down Hollywood Boulevard in the actual Grease Lightning car of a 1948 full deluxe convertible. As we neared the theatre, we got an inkling of what was going to come. It quickly becoming clear that Grease wasn't some 50s throwback movie. It was an event of likes of which Hollywood hadn't seen in quite a long time. Crowd roar was deafening. It was as if we roared, arrived at an Oscars ceremony or a major rock concert. It was nothing short of phenomenal, John said. It was exactly what the Beatles went through when they arrived in the US. The excitement inside the theatre was every, was every bit as raucous as outside. Sunday Night Fever 
had been out for six months and John was an icon. In London, experienced a far calmer experience, but it was a hundred percent wrong. Once again, the fans were beyond excited, gathered in large masses, and many actually broke down barriers set up by those nice London bobbies. They climbed on our car, were trying to slide through the windows to meet us. Within a month, Grease became the highest grossing movie musical to date. It made that way until 2017. The soundtrack went three months to number one, with a song, You're the One I Want, sold over 10 million copies. It lifted my career into the stratosphere, while John became an iconic movie superstar.